Cool. Okay. Okay, so Magic of Empty Teachers, class five. So after today, we only have two more classes, and then we'll take a two-week break at Three Jewels on Tuesday nights. Um, actually, not just Tuesday nights. The last two weeks of August, we have a summer studio closure, and then we start again uh, right after Labor Day. So everybody gets a break to take a rest, go watch some movies, <laughs> catch up on your ACI homework. <laughs> But it is good in that time to actually take a rest too, which we're going to also talk about in today's class. So um, in this course, because I'm giving you the lung, the download that I received from Lama Marutz, who created this particular format inspired by Geshe Michael's silent retreat teachings called The Magic of Empty Teachers. Did you get that particular reading in the first class? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to actually reference that a lot okay. in today's class, actually the last few classes. Um, we're, we've been, you know, laying the foundation with Jade Sun Kappa's Lan Rim Chenmo, with Pabonka Rinpoche's Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand, both exquisite Lam Rims, Lam Rim meaning the steps on the path to enlightenment. And um, because Geshe Michael draws heavily on them, but uh, magic, the magic of empty teachers is really a modern day scripture. You know what I mean? It's something that came to him during retreat as a result of everything he knows and has lived through, the, um, through his own practice of having served at the feet of his teacher for 20 years and as, you know, heading up Diamond Mountain and now the Diamond Cutter Institute and all of that. So. Mm. Lama Marut at this point was um, already a tenured professor of comparative religion. He had been teaching for almost 30 years, if you consider, you know, include graduate school and all of those types, because you'd already teach at that level, right? And he said that he's also, I mean, that's what Lama Marut had, was trained to do, was teach and even before he fell upon this lineage, right? And he says that um, regardless of how many courses he took or seminars on teaching, he's never seen in one place such an exquisite explanation of the qualities of a good teacher. Um, you know, we have Alexander Berzins online. And I last week I said that I would um, scan it and send out a PDF, but I realized it's a free online e-download. So if you just okay. go by that link that we gave out in first class, yeah. then, and if anyone's missing that, they can ask for the link. And um, rather than, I thought that was an interesting, to download something, to scan it, to email it, when <laughs> you can actually just get it off of the internet, didn't make a whole lot of sense. So, um, but again, there's, there's a very, very beautiful, um, Western viewpoint, Eastern experience scholar who really explains the whole teacher, the categories, right? We went through this last class, the different categories of, of teachers, especially if you're talking about the spiritual path. Um, but really, other than that, there isn't any, it's not, just like, you know, in this, I went through business school. I went through the School of Business out at UBC. They don't actually teach you how to um, run a business. <laughs> Interestingly enough, they teach you all the components you need to do that. But there is, unless it's changed, there is nothing that actually says, here are the fundamentals of starting up and running and maintaining a business. And um, the same thing, like in academia, you learn all the knowledge you need to be expert in your field, and along the way, you're supposed to acquire the skills to be able to impart that. But I have to say, back to my university days, I, especially in economics, I kept getting economics professors who were obviously brilliant, who were obviously the top of their field as far as research and analysis went, could hardly speak English and could not teach. It wasn't even the language barrier. It was, and, and they really 
didn't enjoy being around people. So, <laughs> you know, but that was all part of the academic um, culture, right? Like it was the basically the, the brightest and the most researched and the most learned uh, were given the, the plum teaching jobs, but they weren't necessarily the ones who could teach or who even were the best teachers, right? So this is really interesting. We are in a teacher training program. And not only are we learning in this course the karma, because it's all a karma, that you need to um, create your perfect teacher, but how to become one yourself. And you know, as we've learned, uh, the best teachers are also really good students, because that is the karma. And they also teach their students to be good teachers. So there's this, um, symbiotic relationship between teaching and learning, right? And even in academia, I mean, I, I know I've got family who are professional professors and they just love learning. They never wanted to ever leave school and they haven't, you know? <laughs> so there is that too. Um, but uh, that was really, for me, that was really significant for a professional teacher, someone whose career it was to teach, to say that this is one of the best presentations on what the qualities are that a good teacher should have. Um, that's, that's pretty high praise, you know? Okay, so this, today's class is all inspired by day two of the Magic of Empty Teachers. So when we handed it out, we handed out the whole reading, but we said just read day one and then we'll get to day two while well, we are now in day two, okay? And uh, this is where he really gets into listing the qualities and it's done, it's done in English, it's done in a really beautiful way, but it's also done in a very classic way of the ancient scriptures in the fact that it's very pithy. It's very, very poetic phrases and that's it. And that's how all the ancient teachings were done. So that's and fundamental to that. Built into that is the fact that you actually need someone to unpack it for you. <laughs> so, you know, like inherent in the way that ancient teaching scriptures like the Yoga Sutra or the Bhagavad Gita or the Abhidharma Kosha or the, you know, you name it, right? Guide to a Bodhisattva's way of life, even by Master Shanti Deva. It's, we have many, many beautiful courses here that unpack a Guide to a Bodhisattva's way of life. In fact, we introduce it in an early ACI course, but um, the next one, the Vows course, that's going to happen. Yeah. But we unpack the whole guide in three ACI courses, right? Like we take 30 classes to unpack that book. The book itself is sheer poetry. So like that, Geshe Michael has really created um, poetry to, as, you know, and the, the reason I believe, this is just me, but the reason I believe ancient teachings, or teachings who weren't ancient at the time, right? At the time it would have been contemporary teachings, but we consider them ancient now. We're taught in that way is because they're easy to remember. Just like anything put to music is easier to memorize. Anything that is lyrical or poetic and pithy and short is much easier to remember. So um, that way you can always hold it with you, right? But then it does require a commentary. It does require someone to explain. So inherent, fundamental to that system is the need for a teacher, which is kind of cool. Okay. Mm. So we have, uh, uh, but we've been asking all along, um, why do we need a Dharma teacher, right? Like, why is it necessary to find a good teacher to teach you this? And we've also been told that you can't get anywhere. Source of all my good is my kind Lama, my Lord. That's the very first step, right? And uh, really, just to review quickly, we've, we've spent several classes on it, many different phrases, but the short answer is you can't get anywhere without <laughs> one. That's all, right? And... Uh, so in ACI 2, I think it is, the Applied Meditation class course, uh, in the ACI curriculum, we do teach the 
nine stages of meditation and a formal sort of Buddhist preliminary is called the seven limb prayer. And in that, and we've done some of it in some of these classes at the beginning of class where you basically, um, you know, once you have your posture in the seven or eight point posture that they say, you know, we do like our lists, right? So it's always these numbers. And you've settled your mind, then what, when your eyes are closed and you're contemplating this, and it's really a contemplation, not a meditation at this point, but you're getting your mind and your heart prepared, the, one of the most powerful things to do is to call up your teacher, your Lama. So the seven limb prayer, to do it thoroughly, does require that you already have what we say we're um, learning about. Like, we're, we're learning about in this course how to have a teacher, a, a lama, a guru, a root heart teacher, right? But the seven limb prayer pretty much already assumes that you have one. Although we use it anyways because we, we fake it till we make it. <laughs> and we, you know, it's useful to plant the virtue needed to create that being in the first place if you don't already have one. So, you know, and for newbies, we always say think of the holiest person that inspires you. Maybe it's maybe it's Jesus, maybe it's Mother Teresa, maybe it's the Dalai Lama, maybe it's uh, Gandhi, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's President Obama, like who knows who it is. Maybe it's your first grade teacher, you know, but whoever it is, you put them in front of you and you use them. It's okay to use Jesus or Mother Teresa or Gandhi, but it is more useful if you can use someone who personally taught you something directly. Not that they didn't, but, you know, uh, and we'll talk about that too, uh, about the Lama who's actually three valleys away. <laughs> but um, that's the first step, right, in the seven limb thing. You, you call up the teacher or, and you know, sometimes even that doesn't work for, for people who are brand new. Like maybe they're not inspired by the people that I just rattled off. But maybe they can still conjure up, if not the visual, the feeling of a being who would inspire them. So then they do that, right? But if you actually have a Lama who you've chosen to be your Lama, who you are working with, and you can put them in front of you, that's way more tactile and tangible, okay? So that's what we do, and then we um, uh, go through different seven steps with that, actually. But the one thing we do at the end of those seven steps is we bring them up to our crown, and sometimes we melt them down into our heart, or a really useful practice, and this is a bit of a secret practice, is to imagine your angel teacher melting up to your crown, and they say, you know, shrink them down to about the size of, a, uh, of an olive or, or a pea or something facing the same way you are, and um, a really interesting practice is actually not to shrink them down so far and to leave them there. As you go out about your day, walk around as if your teacher <laughs> was sitting on your head. There apparently was a llama who did this um, so well that he would duck when going under, you know, doorways and he wouldn't turn too quickly in case the teacher fell off. And But, you know, and again, you're, he's he's visualizing, right? It's not as if the teacher is really sitting up there, or maybe he was. Like you know, maybe he could see his teacher there. But anyways, the the, the mindfulness, the um, intention was so powerful that that's how he behaved. And you know, it sounds funny and it sounds like an exaggeration, but if only, if only we could keep that clear of visualization. Because if your teacher really was sitting on your head. Would you say the thing that you were about to say? Would you do the thing you were about to do? Would you even have that thought in your head if you know they could read your mind, right? So it's useful to walk around your day as if they were there. And sometimes it's useful when you're doing that seven limb practice as a preliminary to just leave them there for the duration of your practice or your meditation and see if you can walk around with them off the mat for a while. It's, um, here's another one, and this one actually, um, 
I learned from Lamaji, but then I found out when I re referenced my notes that he learned this from Jack Cornfield, who is a very famous Vipassana teacher, American Buddhist teacher in the Theravadan tradition, who said that um, if you have a problem, here's a really good contemplation to do. When, you, when you're all settled and you close your eyes and you call up your teacher, you tell them what the problem is. You can whinge, kvetch, whatever you do to your teacher and give them the problem and then say, you go deal with it. And you watch them in your meditation deal with it. How would your teacher deal, like it's not you dealing with that problem. How would your teacher deal with that problem? Maybe you don't get along with someone at work. Maybe you've just been stood up. Maybe you have a friend who you're really mad at. Like, you know, and and you're unhappy for whatever reason, right? Like, here's the problem, and I don't know what to do. What would you do? And you go ask your teacher on your cushion, and you watch what they do. And then you know what you should do. It's a very interesting... Um, interesting contemplation to do. So the long playing dance version of why you need a Dharma teacher is for all of the reasons we've been talking about in all the four previous classes till today and the short version is you can't get anywhere without them. Okay. So we've also reviewed the qualities of a good student and how it's the symbiotic relationship between a good between having a good teacher and being a good student, meaning that being a good student is what creates the karma for having a good teacher, right? So um, it's then very important to know how to be a good student, right? So a good teacher teaches a student how to be a good student, and that's why this course was even created. This is what we're trying to do, right? So, um, Oh, by the way, back to the preliminaries. The second step in the preliminary after you call up your teacher is to prostrate to them. And, you know, sometimes in this class we've had brand new people who've never prostrated and probably wonder what we do when we hop up and down. But, and we always, I, and I, you know, always correct me if I forget to do this, but explain to them that it's not something they should be doing just because everybody else is doing. That's never the reason. However, a really intended, well-motivated prostration is incredible virtue making. And so in your seven limbs, the second step is to prostrate. Like you're, you see your teacher, you're in contemplation. So it's not like you jump off the cushion and you do your prostrations. You do it in your mind's eye, right? But as you're doing it, while you're doing it, it's the emotion that should be filling your heart. First of all, when you call up your teacher's face, you should already be so in love and overwhelmed that practically tears are coming to your eyes. And as you're prostrating, they're rolling down your face because you are so grateful for what it is that they're doing for you. And what it is that they're doing for you is teaching you how to end your suffering forever, right? You know, can you imagine if you were... And it's interesting, I had um, a fair amount of um, right IT band stuff going on earlier in the summer, and to lie on that side was excruciating, and um, I've had, I have an amazing chiropractor, and I've had some amazing coaching from my yoga teachers and stuff, and the pain is now gone. Um, it comes back if I'm not a good girl, and I, I don't plant enough good karma, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's gone. And so for, for that relief, I am grateful, um, and I recommend my magic chiropractor to everybody, although the waiting list is over a year now, I think, and I don't even know if you can get in. But anyways, she's amazing. Um, but I know the amount of gratitude I feel for that pain being gone. Can you imagine the end of all your suffering? Like... And we don't actually, I'm guilty, I don't necessarily come into Dharma class with that type of awareness. Like if this little pain, which I know was pretty debilitating, is the, the, the relief I feel when it's gone, the end of all suffering, <laughs> like that's, 
a hangnail compared to all of suffering, right? Not even a sliver. It's like a little sliver that you can just pluck out. So really, when you think about it, the amount of gratitude and it's, it's you know, Dharma classes are by donation, they're free not because they're not valuable, it's actually because they're priceless. And to put a true cost on it, people could not actually physically afford it. In fact, in the ancient days, it was, teachings were paid for in gold dust. And there's a really famous story of one teacher just like blowing the dust into the wind, because it's not about the money. It's about the worth that someone puts on it. Um, but that is why Dharma is, offered, um, like the, it's not priced, you know, but it is priceless. So behind a proper prostration, a true prostration is unbelievable gratitude. And um, when you're prostrating, you have to think about how the person you're prostrating, the being that you're prostrating to, who may be appearing in the form of a person, is literally saving you from suffering, literally saving you from suffering. Um, it's a pretty powerful emotion to to think about. And you know what, but you can't fake it. You know, but if we can start with gratitude, if we can start with, and that's why loving kindness and gratitude meditations are so useful, because they help us open our hearts a little bit more, a little bit more, right? Because I gotta tell you, um, once you've been doing this for even a little while, and you're in the presence of a teacher, like if the heart cracks open, it's like, it's just, just spontaneous, right? Like you just wanna kiss the floor. <laughs> so it's not anything that you can force, nor should anyone pretend that when they're not there yet. Um, that's where the fake it till you make it actually doesn't work because it's insincere and you will be planting insincere karma, right? So that's why I always say do not prostrate if you don't understand what it's for. And actually, even when you do, you're not actually prostrating for them. You're prostrating for you. You know why you're humbling yourself, right? You know why you're making the offering. And, uh, and truly, that's why you can prostrate to holy beings sitting on your cushion, outwardly looking like you're not doing anything at all. And some of the beings in this class who might be appearing to not getting up could be doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you that they are, but you can't prove to me that there aren't <laughs> either, right? Yeah, like that. So, um, A little bit more, and then I'm going to pay you a song. Because the rest of the class, um, after this one thing, is going through the poetry. Okay? So, um, the first thing that's addressed in the second day of the Quiet Retreat teachings that the Magic of Empty Teachers is from, remember these teachings are Geshe's. Actually, it wasn't his very first teaching, but it was in the early teachings when he would come out, out of his three-year retreat and teach, right? Um, so this is a question that's addressed, and it might be a homework question. What are the two functions or purposes of studying the qualities of a perfect teacher? Yeah, what are the two functions of going through a laundry list like we're going to? So the first thing is, it's really a matter of identification, right? We need to know what it is that we're looking for. And um, so that when you when you find your teacher, you'll know you found them, right? Like, what is it that you're looking for? But it actually goes deeper than that. You have to know what qualities you're looking for so that, because remember, the teacher isn't out there emanating perfectness <laughs> and just waiting for you to cast your vision their way, right? They, to know what qualities you want in your perfect teacher will inform you as to what you need to develop in yourself. Because you're not going to be able to see it out there if you don't at least have the seed for it in here, right? So it's not that 
your teacher needs to develop more of these qualities that we're going to go through is that you need to know if you want this quality in your teacher you need to develop this seed you need to plant this seed if you're going to get this flower right and that's really what it's about so And you know what's, what's perfect about this? You figure this out for the one thing that is the most important thing in your spiritual career, your teacher, and you figure it out for them, you figure it out for everything. And that's why we teach karma and emptiness in so many different ways here. If you can figure it out for the one thing, you will be able to figure it out for everything. Um, the second purpose for going through a list like this is to um, is to see okay so the first one is to see what you need to develop in yourself the second is to see what you already have which is kind of cool. Mm. Basically what we're doing is we're learning how to be good students. But we're also learning how to be good teachers. And we're also learning about how it is that we can be become good teachers and that is through serving teachers by being good students mm -hmm. right so that's th another way to slice and dice that is we're learning how to be good teachers and good students at the same time mm. so yeah those two things we're trying to figure out what it is we're looking for because we want to know how to develop it or how many of those we might already have, okay? Okay, let's listen to the song. So the first song that I selected for this class is, um, oh, I got the words. Yeah. It's always kind of sweet to look at the lyrics. Yeah. This is um, a really sweet song by Ingrid Michaelson who we like to do covers of in our kirtan here. Um, just pull it up. This is really, um, I found that when I listened, when I heard the song for the first time, and it's interesting, right, when I play you pop songs, because they're on the surface, well, they never say the song is about your teacher, right? <laughs> like, they'll never say that. It's about um, love, or it's about heartache, or it's about, you know, any of those things. But so many of these songs are so dharmic. It's ridiculous. Oops, sorry. I think I'm playing you the wrong song. No, no, it's not. It's right. My bad. Let me start that over again.
the teacher starts to feel, right? Like they gotcha. Okay, so we're going to go through, we're not going to go through all of them today. I think there's like 90 different uh, uh, stanzas and um, we're going to go through, excuse me, uh, we're going to go through about 21 of them today. So I don't know if you have that reading, but these are, are listed just with the phrase, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'll read it out, and then I'll tell you what it means. So the first one, these are the qualities that a teacher should have, right? Uh, a good teacher. So the first one is, they are a grand master with a big toolbox. So the, the way the reading goes is, it just says, a grand master with a big toolbox. So you fill in the, a teacher should have, right? So a grand master with a toolbox. A big toolbox. So a grand master um, means that they should be the very best at what it is that they do, and what it is that they do is teach you Dharma, right? So um, Geshe Michael says, do not settle for anything better than the best. Like, do not go to a second rate teacher when you've got your spiritual real estate at um, risk, right? Like, don't just hand that over to anybody. And uh, the second part, Grandmaster with a big toolbox. A big toolbox is that they've got a lot of, they've got a lot to offer you. Like, if you're going to learn piano, you want to learn piano from someone who can play everything from Bach to Tchaikovsky to Bob Dylan. You know, like, you want to be able to get the full range of skills. Uh, a large repertoire, right, of teachings. And it's not so that they can be so impressive. It's not about that at all. Like you want to load, you want a teacher who has a loaded toolbox so they've got the thing to give you, right, or to give to another student. And to be able to help uh, students in the way that they need. This is why a really good teacher never stops learning because they're constantly trying to improve their craft, right? And so that's what it means, a grandmaster with a big toolbox. And, um, and that's why we have so many different ACI courses and yoga classes and meditation classes, because all of it is providing you with different tools to put in your toolbox, right? Okay, second one, an open bowl of candy. <laughs> so open means that they don't withhold anything. They're just 
there to give out the candy, right? Like to give out the the yummy stuff. It it's kind of like a like an open bowl. Like this is a cl closed bowl, right? But if it's open, then it's like come and get it, right? So like that. Mm. In a way, do you remember the three qualities of a good student were like the three qualities of a pot? Like they needed to not have the lid on, they needed to be right side up and, well right side up and no lid on were the same thing. They needed to be clean and they needed to not be cracked and leaky, right? So the right side up no lid is like the open bowl from the teacher's side of things. Okay, three, three is Desert Dandelion, and this actually says a lot to the place that this poetry came to Geshla, because it was in the middle of the Arizona desert, and apparently a desert dandelion are these, um, they're, they, they're plants that grow near oak trees, apparently, and they've got these little I guess if, like a dandelion, you know, they've got the, you know when a dandelion is in full seed and you can blow at it and they just kind of float along? Well, imagine that with three little hooks on them. So apparently as you walk by these trees, you don't even know it, but you've just, you were just covered in these little desert dandelion hooks and you don't notice because they don't hurt or anything until you try and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then they they just like pierce through all your clothing and everything. So <laughs> I know as an analogy for a teacher, what this means <laughs> is that their transmission, their their uh, teaching, their transmission of the lineage, their transmission of the ancient wisdom is seamless, and it is so smooth and subtle that you don't even know that you're being taught. Like they make it look that easy. Uh, it's like a perfect delivery system. So that's what it means to be a desert dandelion. Not the prickly parts, right? But the fact that they actually cling so effortlessly. And you're walking around with a pant full of, you know, dandelions and you don't even know it. So it's like that. Fourth one is the air we breathe. And what this means is that a good teacher is available. Just like the air, right? Mmm. Part of the availability is also, see it's a karma to have a private class actually. <laughs> it's a karma to be in the same room and have 20 people between you and the teacher and not even be able to get an, a word in edgewise. And um, this is where the joke about, you know, sometimes they say the ideal llama is three valleys away because then you can idealize them and you never have to really know them at all. But that's not a good teacher. Or all the people who might say, you're a Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist too. I study with the Dalai Lama. And it's like, you do? <gasps> How often do you study? Like, do you go to Dharamsala? Or like, when, when do you take audience? And it's like, oh, no, 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 I've read like all his books, you know? And, and I, I go see him when he's at GM Place and I'm in seat 1002, you know? It's like, that's not, not that the teachings aren't precious, not that he doesn't reach through that, but that's not your Lama, okay? Too far away to um, be available. And, um, and too easy to idealize and not use them in the way that they are wanting you to use them. Like teachers want you to use them to get enlightened, mm -hmm. right? And if you're treating them like this perfect idol or icon over here, that's actually giving them some self-existent nature that they don't have. And they can't help you in that way. Okay, the next one is stainless steel. And what this means is that your teacher should have integrity. No matter what, 
Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like this stainless steel integrity. You want them to be honest. You want them to be trustworthy and all of that. Um, it's important that they have integrity. Number six, a sculptor of every stone with a master plan. So a sculptor of every stone is, this always reminds me of um, the sculpture David, where the artist, you know, if you read anything about the artist, he says he saw David in the stone. Like all he did was reveal David, right? It wasn't like he had this block of marble and decided, oh, I'm not going to make a flower. Or I'm going to make a girl. No, I'm going to make a boy. I'm going to make a David. Like he didn't think that. He, he saw, right? So like that, the um, sculptor of every stone, a master teacher sees the diamond in you, sees the potential in this lump of coal, you know, and um, it, and knows, not only sees, so, but with a master plan, right? Also, not only do they see the jewel that's there, but they know how to manifest, how to, not manifest, how to, well, they know that the sculpture is there, they know how to carve it out of the marble, right? They know the diamond is there, they know how to pull it out of the coal. They, um, and it's not the same for every single student, right? So they, they can see the creation within this hardened exterior, and they know the, um, what to do to get it out of, of you. And that's a real skill. It's a real rare skill uh, and it's an insight, right? For a teacher to have that level of insight, to, um, to have a teacher who has that kind of a rare insight, or to be a teacher who has that kind of an insight, is rare. And it's worth working on, even as you start to teach. It's worth working on that ability. Um, you know, I think I've mentioned in class that you can, when we teach the pen thing and it lights up someone, uh, or you know when you're having a conversation in the coffee shop, whether someone's into, like they might ask what you're doing and you might say, oh, I'm studying this. And some of them are genuinely interested. And as soon as you start talking, they get more and more lit up. And others, the screensaver comes on, right? And you know. So with those that get more and more lit up, I always say you can smell it on them. <laughs> like, you know, they, they, you, can, you know when you've lit a fire in someone. And it's like that. It's like that, knowing that there is the potential to understand this stuff in someone. And then knowing them also um, in terms of what will work to keep that spark not only alive, but burning, right? Um, so the next one is a mother bird with a single motive. So a single motive is that the only thing a teacher is interested in is to make them happy. And we're talking ultimate happiness, to be completely free of suffering and to be, um, which is actually nirvana, right? The permanent elimination of our mental afflictions would be the end of our suffering. Um, so to have that focus, and we say we take it further, we say to single-pointedly want to get them enlightened, but even before you get enlightened, you have to reach nirvana, right? So there's that. But the mother bird part, a mother bird with a single motive, so the single motive is that they're only interested in the enlightenment of their charge. But the mother bird part comes, because if you've ever seen mother birds feeding their young, they bring the worm, and they don't need to keep any of it for themselves, right? They just completely give it up. And um, so there's a couple meanings here. One is that the teacher should always be more concerned about the student than they are for themselves. But secondly, that they have a conscience, that they're actually doing things for the greater good with the skills that they have. It's a little bit more subtle. 
Okay, the next one is rocket fuel and a match. So the rocket fuel, this kind of goes back to the sculptor one, where they can see the sculpture in the stone. They can see that um, you have the potential. That's what the rocket fuel is. But the teacher ignites it. That's the match. And they take you beyond whatever you could have thought you would have done by yourself, right? Um, they push you. And this isn't always pleasant. Yeah. This is not pleasant most of the time until in hindsight you realize that, well, actually a good analogy is a yoga class that may be a little more advanced than you're comfortable with, but if you have a good teacher, they will A, modify, but B, push you beyond where you would have gone. And you know what? A pr brilliant example, I mean, all my t Tibetan heart yoga training was like that, but I will never forget a three-hour workshop I attended with um, David Life and Sharon Gannon. They are the duo behind Juva Mukti Studios in New York, they, and they're Anusara teachers, which is already a more rigorous, Anusara is where the flow yoga comes from. And they gave this three-hour workshop in uh, North Vancouver, and I went. And of course, there's like a hundred really advanced yogis <laughs> in the room. And uh, I'm in there. And I was mesmerized because, first of all, there's so many people that you actually have to let go of. And you're, you're mat to mat, so you have to let go of, no one's looking at you, right? And even though you're looking at everyone else. And um, it was the most amazing combination of feeling in completely embraced for three hours and slapped upside of the head at the same time. It was so bizarre. but. They got me into twists I never thought I could. And in one of them, I was in this, you know, my hands were like this far apart. And David came by to spot, and he literally just touched my shoulder, and I was able to do this. Like, it wasn't even a physical manipulation. So it was just, he knew I could go further, right? Like, it was just, it was still taxing and difficult and challenging but after it was over it was like wow like I would not have gone there right so um, and a yoga class is a little bit more of a visceral example I think sometimes in philosophy class or in informal teachings right because a lot of teachings can happen at any given time it may not be so obvious and all it might feel like is that you're being pushed in areas that you just think are unfair or that you don't want to do. It's inconvenient for you in some way, right? And uh, as a teacher, too, you have to understand that your students will resist. But it's not about you. And the teacher knows that it's not about them. Mm. And this is a really, really interesting thing. You know, it's human nature to want to be liked, right? It's human nature to not want to be the bad guy. But sometimes it requires not being the nice guy to teach what needs to be te taught. And um, if you don't do what's necessary, if you don't discipline or reprimand or push in an unpleasant way that may be absolutely necessary. This is not about being mean for mean's sake. That's yeah. not a good teacher either. But if the lesson can only be learned through um, what we call wrathful means, and you don't do it because you don't want to be thought of as a bad person or a meanie, then that very thought is a mental affliction. That very need to be liked is a mental affliction. It's actually a mental affliction to always want people to like you. So, you know, we can turn it around to, remember, like, we're trying to spot what it is that we need, and we need to recognize it in ourselves, right? So we don't want to always feel like we always need to be liked. Like, we actually don't want that. But if we have that, 
we need to like work with that right and eliminate it destroy it do some um, what, what does Lama Root say get all Rambo on its ass <laughs> right like you know you need to like really really deal with that because it is a to think that you want to be liked all the time is actually a mental affliction and you know what that's one of the biggest symptoms of low self-esteem right oh nobody likes me or or this need for attention like well you're paying attention to them what what about me right that's a mental affliction so mm, it's interesting you know at my um, work you know I, I work out at the Japanese Canadian National Museum and Cultural Center we're preparing um, some uh, we're doing work already for some community awards that are going to be given out in the fall. And I think it's already public knowledge who the award recipient, maybe it's not, okay. Maybe I shouldn't say too much. But I will say that this one award is recipient and the sort of background narrative that's being um, told, I had to do some editing on it. And as I'm reading this, the one line that jumped out at me, which is very pertinent to this, is this person, um, credits a lot of their perseverance in their early years to their father who said to them you won't accomplish anything if you want to be liked you will not make the hard decisions if all you want to be is liked mm -hmm. and that's what they're saying about the teacher here right so you know we all would prefer to have the smiley face, pleasant teacher, but that's not necessarily what we need all the time. So that's the rocket fuel and the match. Okay, next one, an echo. This means that a good teacher gives you feedback. They may not respond to every single email or phone call, and sometimes the answer is no answer, but they will always give you feedback. So, you know, the way the ACIs are set up, where you have to do, I mean, you don't have to do them, but if you want to get the credit so that you can then legitimately teach this stuff to others, um, you do your homeworks, quizzes, and final, right? That is a feedback method. And when you hand them in, they should be marked, and you should get the comments back on the, um, on the coursework. I have to admit I haven't marked m many people's lately, one because of other priorities, but two because there's so many people qualified now to <laughs> mark. But I remember marking people's works and um, you know it would be super easy to just tick, 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 but I really like to look at how a student answered it, whether it was a right answer, a wrong answer, or a so-so answer. It would be interesting if it was a right answer, like how was it resolved? Like were they just parroting the answer key or did they really get it, right? And then you leave comments. And I know that um, sometimes those comments from your teacher, or maybe it wasn't even your teacher, like someone who was marking it, but those comments can be even more useful than the, the actual process of studying for that particular assignment, you know? Yeah. So as a teacher, you should always mark those works and give them back. <laughs> I had to shift my, my own karma up on that because in um, the early years here, especially with my yoga homework, sometimes it would take years for it to get back to me. And I remember once it got lost, had to redo it. But the redoing it was not... It's interesting. I had enough dharma under my belt to know that the redoing it was not... A hardship. The redoing it was actually a karma that was ripening, that was helping me to learn it better, you know? Whereas if I hadn't had that much training by then, I would have just been ticked off at the person whose fault it was that, you know, like, and none of that's true, right? So, um, yeah, interesting. But the feedback is important. Next one, correcting and driving with a carrot and a stick. Sounds like that Sharon David yoga thing I went to, right? <laughs> 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 All 
uh, correcting and driving with a carrot and a stick. So the correcting. The reason you go to a teacher anyways is because you don't know everything already, right? And you, you will require some correction. So don't get bummed out when they correct you. <laughs> If you've taken on a teacher, they will correct you. That's the whole point, right? So, uh, and as a teacher, you know, it kind of reflects that last one about don't always be Mr. Nice Guy. Like, don't be afraid to correct when it's necessary. So, with a carrot and a stick means that you do it with encouragement and rewards, um, but you also... Um, <laughs> Lama G says, you also smack them figuratively when they need it. But by the way, Zen masters smack you literally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one, a gas pedal. This is cute. This means that a teacher who doesn't go too fast or too slow for you also knows the right pace for the student. And this refers to the uh, comment I made around our two-week break and how part of it should be an absolute rest because um, there is Dharma burnout. I've seen it. You know, it's kind of sad, but sometimes the brightest sparks are the quickest to burn out. And that is that is such a shame because the one thing that could have saved them is the thing they turn away from because they've overdone it, right? So a teacher will know when to tell their student, you have to take one day off. You, and that day off is not spent transcribing on your computer. Um, it's, you know, transcribing your, your last Dharma lecture on your, it's actually not spent doing ACI homework, you know? Um, it is about getting rest for rest sake so that you can be refreshed and revived so that you can get back joyfully to the Dharma studies at hand, right? Um, now, the opposite is true too, knowing the gas pedal. If a student is basically not doing the work they should and is resting more than they should, then you load them up with assignments <laughs> and you just like keep them tasked until you have to tell them, okay, take a day off, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you have to know. Um, and from the student's perspective, right, the capacity thing, that is the first thing that you'll hear is that I, I just can't do this, or I, like, how do you do that? You know, it's just, or they're, or they're too busy, or they're too tired, or you're too this, too that. And um, it's not in this class, but in another class, the whole compassion fatigue syndrome is addressed. And it's actually an oxymoron. You cannot have fatigue from compassion. <laughs> you actually can't. Um, not if it's true compassion. If it's compassion disguised as your own ego's need to be liked by everyone or to be seen as some sort of a saint, then yeah, you're going to have fatigue because that's not true compassion, right? Um, in fact, true compassion gets more energized. And that's actually a difference when you know if you're motivated truly by compassion or by some by your own ego at a certain level is how energized are you by the effort. But again, that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't rest. You should. And those who are so like energized by this are so, so sometimes the people that you have to say, whoa, you need to sleep in tomorrow, <laughs> you know, like it's just our, our let's go to a movie and it'll be like some cheese ball, <laughs> mindless movie and of course there will be a Dharma message because you can't help it if your seeds are there, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, and that's why actually at Diamond Mountain they take midterm movie breaks. Um, they also do uh, karma breaks too where they'll not have class and instead all go into the nearest town and help the community. Because those are the things, right? Like doing for others and resting so that you can do for others more tomorrow are um, 
bodhisattva activities, right? Like they're they're very very helpful and not. So this whole compassion fatigue or the fact that um, being so busy, 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 busyness is another form of laziness. Actually, if it's distracting you from what you need to be doing to get yourself out of suffering and to get others out of suffering. So if all you're doing is filling your um, agenda with things that make you look so important and, <laughs> you know, um, make you feel important because you've got this meeting and that meeting and, you know, uh, and you're always late for them because you've been at the one before and it's gone on too long, then that's just bullshit, you know, like it really is. So like that gas pedal. you got to be able to spot it in yourself, too. Okay, next one. A general with the orders. So we're talking about a military general. General with the orders. What this means is that a teacher should have an aura of, of um, authority. They should be able to authoritatively lead a class and not have the class run amok. Because, <laughs> you know, that actually is out of kindness for the students. Like, it's, it's really inconsiderate if a class is out of control and the teacher isn't taking charge of it. It's just consider inconsiderate to the people who are there to learn. And it's completely bad karma for the student who's acting up to continue to act up and disturb the peace of others, right? Okay, next one, a pillow. <laughs> Doesn't mean that your students get to nap <laughs> on you all the time. It means that um, you should make it easy for students to come at the beginning, especially at the beginning. Then you can swack them over the head. <laughs> no. And this is what I mean about the putting things out and making the place welcoming. That is so important. So thank you, Zoe, for being such an amazing class producer. Um, and what they say is that if you personally can't do it as a teacher, you should have a system in place where it gets done and that new people are welcome. And you know, this is gorgeous that we have the prayer lists and the instructions. And the, there used to be a book up at the front that explained about um, maybe it's up in the library, um, that explains about what we're all about and what the, you know, the different, um, different, everything from leaving a donation to prostrating to, you know, all the different things that are so kind of weird to figure out if you don't have someone to show you. And in a way, that's teaching at the first level, right? But to make someone feel comfortable and welcome is really important, especially if they're brand new and it's all a bit of a scary adventure for them, right? Okay, next one. Ant with winter com coming. We're talking about ants. Ant with winter coming. Okay, so what this means is that um, a good teacher is always prepared. <laughs> Uh, like ants who get ready for winter, right? Like they're they're const Actually, ants are amazing. I saw this art installation where, and actually, I saw some of this when I was in teacher training in Mexico. There was this trail of ants, and they were all carrying like a leaf or something. There was this care of they were all transporting, and the line of ants went as far as you could see, and they were all carrying something like they were. There, and sometimes the leaves were like twice the size that they were, you know, but I don't know if it was food they were stocking up on or what it was, but remarkable. And then when you think of anthills, right, and how they work in colonies and stuff, it's preparation. They're, they're uh, amongst a lot of the sentient beings, they're very much about preparation. Mm. So as a teacher, right, a good teacher should be prepared. And this is an interesting skill to cultivate in ourselves when we're learning. You know, back to the university teachers who are so uh, academic but can't teach. Something that happens sometimes to new teachers is that, you know, they've, they've spent, what, a decade of learning and then they have to give a class that's an hour and a half long and they need to download all of that stuff, right? So they prepare their notes and stuff, but they have no idea how much time it's going to take to actually deliver it. So they either run out of time or they don't teach everything that they wanted to. So there, there is a skill to being prepared. And, you know, it may sound like I wing it here, <laughs> but if it was truly just winging it, you would know because you wouldn't be getting the stuff right and so they say like, you can't just because you've studied it doesn't mean you can wing it and the now that's not to say 
that a skilled teacher, and I just watched Lama Root do this recently, you show up with prepared to talk about a certain thing, and the audience is not the audience that you were expecting to receive this particular talk, you switch it up. And I've seen him do it, I've seen Geshe Michael do it, um, and it is something that you can only do if you have been prepared. Maybe not prepared with that particular, but so much preparation that it just flows through you, right? Like that. Those are the ants getting ready for winter. Okay, next one. Branching tunnels ready. <laughs> this one you really wouldn't understand without the uh, commentary. This is a metaphor for a mole and their escape hatches. You know, a mole that bur burrows in the earth? Branching tunnels ready. What this means is what I just said about a teacher being prepared who can make on-the-spot adjustments. That's what branching tunnels ready are. Okay. Just like you were already ahead of the class by <laughs> preparing for everybody and you didn't even hear this yet, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, next one. A chameleon on the same old rock. So the same old rock means that you're consistent, and a teacher should be consistent. Uh, the presentation should always be consistent internally in that they should be free of contradiction. And then externally, you know, over time, the teaching should not, it shouldn't be one teaching one day and another teaching the next when you're talking about the same thing, right? That's the rock thing. The chameleon thing, a chameleon is totally not consistent, right? A chameleon is a chameleon because they change the colors depending on whatever environment they're in, right? So here's the thing, and actually this I take from the authority that is Lama Marut who is taught at the university level, where he says, you know, very often he would teach um, a 100 level class and he would say one thing in the morning and that afternoon teach a grad class, a uh, master's class in the same topic and say the complete opposite. Was there a contradiction? No. Because he was teaching at a level that needed to be to lay the foundation and once they already had that foundation they could hear this other teaching that will t that took them to a higher that they required a higher level of wisdom to understand it right so i was thinking about this chameleon and the old rock thing and sure a chameleon is um, like inconsistent in its color but it's consistent in being a chameleon <laughs> right so same old rock chameleon on the same old rock means that you are consistent with the truth. You're consistent with the wisdom, but how you present it may shift, and even what you say may sound contrary, but it isn't. Lord Buddha did this. In the, three tur in the first turning of the wheel, he said everything exists. In the second turning of the wheel, he said nothing exists. In the third turning of the wheel, he said some things exist and some <laughs> things don't exist, right? Was he lying the other two times, right? <laughs> So, and if you want to go into the really high teachings, they say those three teachings happened all at the same time. And that it was just a matter of who had the ears, the karma to hear which level of teaching they received, right? Like that. Okay, next one, lawn of grass. This means, believe it or not, equanimity. Because the grass doesn't care who walks on them, right? <laughs> you treat everyone the same. So a good teacher does not favor one over another, but it doesn't mean they teach exactly the same thing to every single student, or that they treat them the same. They don't favor one over the other. But remember back to that gas pedal and knowing the capacity of the student and all of that? Um, to be a lawn of grass is to equally love the student for the diamond that they are. The students are all different, so the teachings may all have to be different or delivered in different ways. And like I say, they say Lord Buddha taught all those three things at the same time, but he taught it so skillfully, right, that each one got what they needed, but he shared his wisdom equally, right, like that. Old Temple Gong is the next one. So, um, 
this kind of goes back to that same issue about wanting everybody to like you, um, which we said is a mental affliction and that you really have to, to root that one out. This is about, and this is actually combined with the one where you may have to give harsh teachings to push the student to where they need to go. In either instance, if you have to teach harshly or you have to push someone beyond their comfort zone, you're going to get pushback. You're going to get um, resistance. So you be like the old temple gong that keeps getting hit, and you just keep on ringing, you know? Okay. And you don't, you don't emote back, you don't take it personally, they're just doing their thing, right? <laughs> so it's like that. Be eternally beatable, Lama Ji says. Okay, we're almost done. Next one, pruning shears for a fresh sapling. This is actually a really difficult one. You know, I think I talked last class about how some students might be, you might not be able to teach them, right? Remember the student that walked out one too many times and then Lamaji said, you can't come back? Not because they were mad at the student, but because they, he knew he could not teach them and that would be more damaging for the student to um, keep doing that. Well, that's what this is. Um, on rare occasions, when you do realize that you cannot teach, the, and it's not personal, it's not because you don't like them or that you think they're stupid. It's like none of those reasons. You know that you're not the right teacher for them. You have to be able to cut them loose. That's what the pruning shears are for a fresh sapling. The optimal thing is if you can send them to someone you know who can help them. And I have actually had direct experience of this, of um, seeing this happen in our lineage, where a student w may have started with one teacher, and they still see them as student-teacher both ways, you know, just like we've said it before, just because you're not in the company of your teacher doesn't mean they're not your teacher anymore, which is different from saying that Dalai Lama is your teacher when you've never been in his company, okay? <laughs> but, you know, there is that where the student may be sent away for whatever reason um, on the outward appearance, but always from the teacher's reason for their own uh, progress. Um, it's ideal if you can send them to someone who you know can teach them. So, but that's hard, right? Next one, Mount Meru and a rubber ball. Remember when we do this at the beginning of class to make an offering? That's Mount Meru, which is considered in South Asian cosmology the center of the universe. And what it means is that um, Mount Meru and a rubber ball, what this means is that inevitably there will be hard times. Inevitably, there will be disasters. Inevitably, there will be crisis and chaos. Because we live in samsara, right? And um, the teacher needs to be unshakable, even in the face of negative events, in the face of um, chaos or um, bad press or rumors or anything like that, they need to have um, unshakable confidence in the teachings. And um, be like a rubber ball means that they bounce back, that they don't give up. Even when crap happens, they, um, they're unshakable in the fact that they still teach. The next one is teacher of learning and teaching. And we've already said this, right? A teacher teaches a student how to be a good student, but also how to be a good teacher. So a teacher is a teacher of learning, teaching them how to be a good student, and of teaching, teaching a student how to be a good teacher, which is an important one. Oh, that was the last one we're going to do today out of the... Um, Magic of Empty Teachers, Quiet Retreat Teachings, but I'm going to run through in the last five minutes the two more uh, of the qualities. You know, we have that other laundry list of qualities of a good teacher. So this is number 15 on the list. A good teacher respects other good teachers and rejoices in their successes. 
This is a very powerful tool for becoming a better teacher yourself. And it's a hard one, actually, because jealousy and envy at the professional level even happens. I actually, Geshe-la speaks ad nauseum in the ACI teachings and in other public teachings about how his worst uh, mental affliction was jealousy. I truly believe he says that for our benefit. But he'll give examples, like when he was a young monk, he wanted to desperately learn Tibetan. The man who writes all of these exquisite <laughs> translations from Tibetan, right? But there was a time when he didn't speak or read it Tibetan, and he desperately wanted to. But when he got to his um, Lama's monastery, Ken Rinpoche, who was his Lama for 20 years, there was already someone there um, named Art Engel, who was already the translator and, you know, like the Tibetan favorite. And, it's, uh, and so Geshla was always sent out to water the garden while this other fellow got to do the translating and stuff, right? And he talks about being jealous. And then he even talks about, you know, that was when he was, he would have been in his 20s. But he talks about even now, you know, the thing about being jealous of other teachers. And again, I know it's for our benefit. <laughs> but it's because we can all go, yeah, yeah, I feel that too, right? And... Uh, so it's particularly important to rejoice for um, teachers, especially those who are better than you. It's easy to rejoice for the teachers that you think aren't as good as you because you're like encouraging them on and maybe you were even their teacher, right? But the ones who are better than you, they're competition, right? So, but those are the ones that you really need to rejoice for. Yeah. And I got to tell you from personal experience that you might fake it till you make it for the first little while, but if you keep this up, you sincerely rejoice for them, and it feels pretty instantly damn good. Mm. So, you know, I know karma doesn't work that quickly, but I have to tell you, gratitude does make your heart feel happier pretty instantaneously. So I encourage everyone to do that. 16. Uh, a good teacher owns the subject and does not just parrot someone else's words. I do quote a lot from Lamaji and from things I remember from Holy Geshe Michael, but um, I definitely hope that you hear it as my voice and not, well, mind you, I can't even mimic Lamaji's voice, although he's a really good mimic of the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Next time he comes into town, you should ask him to impersonate the Dalai Lama. He does it really well. But even that is not parroting, right? So, like, if I was sitting here reading this word for word, I would not be doing <laughs> the course or you any justice. But so it kind of goes without saying that a good teacher um, really, when they say owns the subject, really knows it, having studied it, having practiced it, right? And um, because, you know, you can tell. If you sit in a class where that's all the teacher is doing, it's dead boring, right? Like it's, you might as well listen to the audio of someone who's a better speaker. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't make sense. So that's pretty, pretty logical. Okay, that is class. So we'll work our way through um, more of those pithy, pithy comments in the next, uh, next two classes. Okay. Yeah, those are good. So now when you read the reading, you'll, uh, well, actually, in his teaching, he does give, um, he doesn't just say the line, but this is, um, they are lines that if you just heard them, you wouldn't necessarily know what they meant, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Especially that branching tunnels thing, <laughs> but anyways. Okay, let's dedicate. Sashi Kuki. Jug shing mei tong Drum ri rabbing shi Nyan de gyan ba di Sang ge shing du Mik te u wa Gi dro gu nam dak Shing la chu ba shong Iram Guru Radna Mandala Kam Niriyatayami Gewa Dee Gewa 
歌，是那面水足足心，是那面水泪珍味，当把歌里走把手。I forgot to play you the last song. Oh. I'm going to play it for you because yeah. it actually is about what the student feels like <laughs> <laughs> with all of this. <laughs> I remember preparing for this, and I this song is is I don't know about ten years old now I think, but it's um it just came popped into my head. <laughs>